started. Every week, we bring you a show with CEOs, builders, and thought leaders in different fields to give you insights into your business and marketing to get you ahead of the technological paradigm shift we're experiencing right now. All that while having a bit of fun. Today, my speaker is the CEO of Neurons Inc., Thomas Ramsey, uh, a person who I waited to speak for a long time, ever since I found his content on the internet about neuromarketing and one of the reasons why I was really interested in neuromarketing myself for the work which I do as a, a founder of a marketing agency. And a lot of the work I found on the internet was very basic. It was very um, hypey, 10 life hacks to convert your customer, all the stuff. And it didn't really, it didn't seem any, it didn't seem to have any basis behind it. It's just like, oh, you read it somewhere, you reiterate it somewhere, but with the neurons and I really found like a lot of helpful stuff on the blog there. And I also uh, found uh, Thomas and his knowledge uh, astonished me. So Thomas, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who you are, what it is you do, what is Neurons? Absolutely. And uh, thank you for having me on. Um, so I, I, my background is uh, pretty mixed. I, um, I actually started studying business and economics, then switched over to philosophy and then switched over to psychology. And I, I, I am a psychologist and a neuropsychologist by training, worked many years as a clinical neuropsychologist before I did a PhD in, um, in, uh, in neurobiology and neuroimaging, so brain imaging, so to speak. And after that, I've been uh, working on kind of establishing research centers with, uh, you know, university hospitals and business school, for example, in Copenhagen, and studying how we are making decisions and how the brain helps us kind of, you know, what what happens in the brain when we're making decisions. So it's kind of a, my, my background is a good blend of, you know, high level philosophy to, you know, hard science and then pragmatic application of how can we actually make things work and how can we understand everyday decision making, so to speak. Um, I'm also the, 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 the founder and CEO of Neurons, as you mentioned. So, so that means that I, I started a company 10 years ago. Uh, I've actually been running companies for many years before that as well. So I've been doing multiple kind of consultancies and, you know, helping companies understand the human mind and how we should do anything from change management and leadership and management all the way to, you know, marketing and things like that. So the Neurons was, was kind of the, the, the big kind of upset where I, uh, I was have, we've been pretty success, successful in making uh, hard science uh, understandable and useful for our clients. And now in the most recent years, we've kind of sped up that process so that we can we've now combined the neuroscience and psychology with AI. So we can instead of measuring that takes, uh, you know, weeks and even months sometimes for a project to complete and it's costly and it's complex and everything like that. Now you can basically do the same thing with an AI prediction engine that works online in, in seconds to minutes instead. So that's like the, the short and quick rundown of uh, the background. Yeah, the AI have upset it, like a lot of industries. And um, is it uh, correct to say that like your products, which you currently have, they're all uh, AI based? Absolutely. So you can see it this way that for many years we, we focused on being the best at measuring visual attention with eye tracking and emotional and cognitive responses with EEG uh, brain uh, scanners or brain monitors. Um, we also had from day one a very kind of open book policy. So we agreed to kind of pu publish our data in peer-reviewed science. We were always kind of very open and transparent with our clients in terms of how we were collecting the data, how we calculated the scores and, and everything like that. So it generated a lot of trust. And we also, you know, what we get, got in, got back from that was also that the clients we worked with were also willing to share back so we could validate the methods and metrics that we used to say, okay, these metrics tend to predict in-market effects. And I think that's like the holy grail in marketing is that there's, there's this saying that's like 60, 70 years old from John Wanamaker that says, you know, 50% 50, 50 or half of my, my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which half it is, right? And I think that we're still in that process. We, we, you know, a lot of people think that marketing is uh, an extremely precise. It's a precision sniper kind of uh, approach, but it's not really. Uh, when we talk to brand uh, brand managers and 
and performer marketers, for example, they, typically what happens is that they generate a ton of different campaign materials and they test it out with A-B testing to see, you know, what sticks, what works. So a big that's a big problem in, in two respects. First of all, it generates a lot of uh, it generates a lot of content. It's a lot of kind of it's a tedious process um, to understand, you know, uh, what works and what doesn't work. And the second is more like if you constantly are experimenting on your prospective uh, uh, customers. So that means that you're constantly uh, showing them ads that, you know, work or don't work. So that means that are you diluting your brand? Are you diluting your messaging? So there are some potential backside of constantly doing A-B testing on, on, your, on your market, so to speak. So what we have done for many years is to find metrics that can predict these in-market effects before you even try doing A-B testing. Um, as I mentioned before, that took time, it cost money, and it required you to have a certain level of sophistication when it comes to understanding what these metrics meant. But what we have done since 2018, 19 is to now to take those data that we have and the big data set we have and created these AI models that instead of eye tracking, for example, instead of running a, a study with 30, 40, 50 people to see where people are looking, we now have an AI model that accurately predicts where people are looking instead. The analysis takes seconds if it's an image. By contrast, if you had to do an eye tracking study, it would take you a week, for example, as, at least. So. And, and the cost is also, it's, it's, it's a fraction of the cost as well. So what we are doing is we're basically changing the game, so to speak. So for those people who are used to doing eye tracking studies, now they get the same results much faster and much cheaper than they will usually do. And for a big part of the market that would never have, you know, the budgets for doing these complex, uh, sophisticated studies, they would now get access to something, a tool that would do the same thing for a fraction of the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, like I'm currently thinking of becoming one of your clients and to use it in my own work because it's again, uh, I feel I feel so important. And uh, th that's what I'm saying. You know, I've, I was doing a lot of social media content last year. And that's where the question about like reels and video focused content came up because a lot of reels I'm not even sure if it's based in anything, but because of the short attention spans, which we seem to be getting more and more thanks to different sorts of video formats. Now, everybody was trying to do different hooks with reels, uh, video editing uh, tricks, just to grab attention. Obviously like hype titles. And um, Again, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I understand when they work and why they work because they spike certain emotions. But could you maybe talk a little bit about this? Do, do you do anything with uh, video which can be analyzed how well a video is going to perform? And also what can be some of those cognitive biases which really grab people's attention when it comes to video or even if it's just like uh, image format? Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, we are we are working. So right now we have worked out the kind of the metrics, and we're still you know continuously improving on the product. So one thing is, as I mentioned before, being able to predict uh, attentional responses, so where people are paying attention and where they're not looking. I think there's a, already now the AI has learned what marketers have not learned for you know decades, which is not never to present something in the bottom right corner, uh, because that's you know if you put your brand down in the bottom right corner, only four percent of people will see it. So that means that if you have a marketing asset for your listeners here, um, and you can look at your 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 you know talk to your brand manager or you know look at your marketing assets and you see that there's a brand button in the bottom right corner, you can be damn sure that it's not going to work. People will see the ad, but they will never see what the brand was. So that's uh, the AI has already learned that, and now we're moving way beyond attention. So we have something we call the four power model, and this is a model that we worked out together with Stanford Business School. Uh, we worked with uh, Professor Baba Shiv, and we we have come up with a way, kind of a framework for for the the most important steps in within the first few seconds that marketing ads, assets need to work on in order to have success. We find first of all, it, they need to have stopping power. They need to to grab and just hold on to attention. The second step is that they need to be engaging. So that's what we call persuasion power. They need to persuade people that. It's worth spending time on. 
The third is what we call transmission, which is all about kind of transmitting the message to be understood, not be confusing to people or overloading to people. And the final step is being memorized. So that means that leading to a brand memory, brand recognition, for example, but also to put the right associations to your brand, for example. If you succeed with those four steps, you're basically moving 90% of the needle for having uh, commercial success. Um, so what, this is what we have kind of built the eye tracking EEG data on. And now we are training AI models to now be able to predict the same. So we're currently predicting attention. We are having in beta now, uh, being able to predict uh, cognitive, certain types of cognitive responses and certain types of emotional responses. And then later on, we predict in memory as well. That's coming up very soon. So that's like the, the, um, the, the, the funnel, if, if you like. So I think that as uh, these tools become more and more prevalent and used by, by, by clients, as we see they are, we see that they are improving click-through rate, brand recognition, in-market effects. We see that again and again and again. It's that on average, they say that they actually reduce the time by 20% uh, uh, time spent on deliberating about brands and which ones to go for. And they're also increasing the accuracy of the the, the 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 marketing campaign by more than 20 percent so that means that on average that is so that means that there's a huge cost saving and there's a huge precision uh, increase by using the tools that you know you can get through kind of these ai predictive models uh when it comes to uh these kind of different kind of biases that we see and i mentioned before this kind of the, what we call the corner of death the bottom right corner there are other things that we've seen as well is that uh, we did a, a huge study a couple of years ago with the Mobile Marketing Association and the Advertising Research Foundation in the US, together with some of the biggest, um, all the kind of the big social media uh, companies uh, out of the US. So that would be, you know, Facebook, Meta, uh, Instagram, and things like that. So we tested how long does an ad need to be in the feed in order to have an impact, to be seen, to have to to cause an emotional and cognitive response. And we saw that even within the first second, there was a huge kind of significant response that actually predicted how people felt about the brand afterwards. So this means that even as one second exposure, if you if you succeed, if you have an ad that captures people's attention within the first second, you can actually have a success in your branding, in your call to action campaign. But we also saw on the other side is that people on average left the ad again after three and a half seconds. So that means that people don't spend the time that you want them to typically on the ad so if you have a 50 second long video you shouldn't expect them to see more than three four seconds uh ish on average so that means that there's work to do if you haven't present your brand or your product or your particular kind of call to action within the first three seconds you're going to miss out on the key purpose of your your campaign so that's like some of these things and maybe a third thing that is important in the social media days is that we see that people, on average, they build up this um, advertising uh, allergic reaction, if you like. So we see that they have almost like an immune response uh, to uh, to ads, and this means that as they go through the feed and they they the next uh, feed item is is uh, is an ad, they typically scroll off even faster than looking at an organic uh, content. So this means that we are learn as a culture culture we learn to avoid ads more and more so that means that you know there's work to do for the for the advertising industry mm -hmm. what do you think about the ads which are i'm not a fan of those but like the ones which mimic uh, social media content and try to tell some sort of a story but with the end being like a call to action to like um yeah, I think that uh, there, there's actually a ton of those, and we even got them back from the the TVC days as well as that. You know, you had commercials that were more entertaining, and the ad liking was really high. The ad recognition and ad memory is is really high, and we see that today as well. The problem is that, it, and I think that on average the, these are not bad because they actually give people a laugh or they give some entertainment value to them. The problem with that is that most of those, or a vast majority of those ads they tend to have almost like a disconnect between the ad narrative and the brand. So that means that they create this funny narrative and there's a punchline and everybody laughs and then you kind of smack the brand at the end. What we see again and again is that that leads to a disconnect between the ad and the brand. So we see that people who do this, 
they they actually miss out on on who the brand was for. They remember the ad, but they forget who it was for. So I think that's one of the kind of the big challenges that we see from the advertising uh, industry uh, these days. Mm. And um, do you have any data on long form content? Like, for example, I'm uh, those uh, my podcast goes on uh, obviously podcast platforms, but it also goes on YouTube platform. And one of the big things in like YouTube is the user retention score. And I'm constantly fighting to make the video more entertaining and push the actual like retention of the watch longer. Do you have any tips how to do it with the long form? Because with the small form, it's uh, snappy, it's fast, you deliver the message pretty quickly. But again, you can't do it like the same of like a conversational video like we're trying to do right now. It just yeah. um, wouldn't really carry the same informational message which we're trying to do with the long form one. Yeah, I, I think that I, I would, the first step is to actually to start even before, even before people start looking at the ad, what kind of mindset do they come with? I think that's, that's the first thing. That means that, you know, thumbnail design is a big thing these days. So we see that a lot of kind of YouTubers, they're spending a lot of money on optimizing the thumbnails uh, because we also see that first of all it increases the click rates so that means that if you have a thumbnail that performs better than others it means that people are more likely to click on uh on on on, on that and view at least start watching it if you then you saw title uh design of that thumbnail and also the title of the you know the, the actual video itself will help you kind of bring people into the right mindset to, you know, the worst case would be that you tell them some, one thing and once they start watching, it's not what they expected. That would be then they're out again very, very quickly. The second I would have, I would analyze basically viewership. And I, I can't remember if, uh, how much data access you get, but it's like, if you can see the drop-off rates of your videos, for example, if you see people are dropping out on certain places after certain times on average, for example, we see that typically after, you know, three or four minutes, a lot of people jump off, for example, that means that you need to do something. You need to switch it up a little, a little bit. So I think that what, what you can consider is also, um, you know, it requires more editing, uh, but it will require you to say, oh, there's certain things you should do as a break, for example. So there will be more, you know, it could be, for example, as part of this podcast uh, episode, you can, at this point, for example, make a break and say, you know, here are three uh, fun facts about the brain or, you know, five, uh, you know, ways to boost your social media campaign, for example. And then I know you just said that it's like, that's that's one of the things you didn't like too much, but I think that for this content as a breakup to uh, for the long long format, uh, if people drop off, then that will be kind of a way to boost it. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> you know, I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's less of a question. It's more of like uh, a tangent here, but I'm really curious about like the long form content of some of the bigger creators, because I've seen the data for small to medium creators and yeah the drop off is just as you explained it starts pretty high and kind of like the first three four minutes it drops out and then it kind of plateaus uh i wonder if it's the same for everybody or like the personal brand and the image of the people also plays a big role into like having it like less of a drop off at the start going forward but again i haven't seen it so like i can't really i can only have off size here um Regarding the breaks, uh, it's not so that I don't like it. It's just, it just I like being very in depth to the stuff, and that's the thing. Mm. And like people like trying, when I try to search something, a lot of the Google blogs and people which are right are written for SEO purposes or written for high mm. purposes or like if you uh, exist in LinkedIn echo chamber. It's like a lot of stuff which is copy pasted from somebody, but like it's not actual information which is supported and which is applicable, which is like, again, the mission statement of my podcast here is like to bring applicable information. So that's like mm -hmm. what can people take away so they can like go away and implement somehow into their own marketing efforts or like business efforts if we're talking about something different, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of brings me to the question of what could companies do? without uh, becoming neurons clients yet uh, but what can they do right now to improve their kind of neuromarketing tactics smartly again you spoke about a bit about like the cognitive biases but even then where should people just maybe start what should they look at first kind of you know the basics yeah 
Yeah, that's a very good, point, good question. I think that, you know, to answer that, let me take kind of a quick step back and say, you know, what type of research uh, should you do, basically, right? I think that when I, I, I see in your marketing, but also in general, you know, when we talk about science and application, we see three different types of science going on. We have basic science. So basic science is anything from, you know, studying, uh, you know, uh, astrophysics and black holes or, you know, the, the, the basic of how the brain works, for example, or the relationship between the brain and the mind, for example. That is like basic research. It, it works on its own premises to understand to the very, in, you know, the depth of what is going on. Um, then there are certain of those findings that are applicable because, you know, if it turns out that, let's say, we can only remember seven things at a time. Um, if that number is 20 or if it's 100 or if it's two, you know, that it, it matters, right? Because that will be, that will inform how should we communicate to people? If we not say that okay, it's seven plus minus two. So that means that people on average will remember five to nine different pieces of information. Okay, so that means that you should not make a, a bullet point list with uh, 10 items because that's that's too much for most people or 20 items. So that means that you can take a, you know inspiration from a basic science and you can say, okay, based on this science, I can make my own kind of do's and don't list. Uh, that's what I call translational science. That's where you translate basic science into application. And, um, and, and there are also a lot of people that write, you know, popular science books and, you know, different types of books that also provide this for you, you know, including my own books, for example, but also people like Steve Genko and, and others that, that provide these kind of checklists for do's and don'ts uh, based on the science. And then finally, the third type of science is what we call applied science. So applied neuroscience, for example, that's where you use the tools from the kind of the deep science, but you, you, you do it to answer very specific questions. Will this version of the ad or this version of the ad work better? Or will this ad work best in, you know, East Coast US or West Coast US or, or mid US, for example? Uh, would it work for high affluence and affluent, uh, low affluence people? Or would it work for different uh, ethnicities, for example? So you, you ask questions to the data and then you test to see, will this campaign actually work for that, that prospect? So that's where you use the tools to get very specific answers. And in, you know, until now, the last part has been very complex. It's been expensive, complex and taking time. And, you know, so, so that's, as I mentioned before, but now with the AI tools, it becomes much more available. And I think that's what we're seeing now is a revolution in the application of these, these insights, because all of a sudden they become everyday tools. You just upload your material in, a, in an online platform, for example. So, so I think those are some of the, 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 the bigger kind of use cases, the way I see it. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the big clients, if you're comfortable speaking about those, which you've worked on sure, some I, results, which you maybe have delivered to them, so like people can. Yeah, I think uh, there, there's like two different things. So, so on the one side, we have we're basically working with I would say more or less every single company you can imagine. So the Googles, the Coca Colas, the Procter and Gambles, the <clears throat> Godiva. You're you're in uh, you're in Turkey, so you know Godiva chocolates. So uh, yes, that too, and you know there's tons of different, you know, we have all these clients and we've been very fortunate to be able to work with them and still work with them. Um, and then on the other side, we have different types of projects we can talk about, but very rarely we can say that we did this project for this client, right? So what I can talk about is, you know, we, we, we do have some clients sometimes to say, yes, let's publicize this, this research, for example. So, uh, you know, for example, we, we have been working, as mentioned before, Mobile Marketing Association and Advertising Research Foundation and all the big social media companies. We also uh, worked on several ways of understanding how advertising works on TikTok, for example. So that's one of the platforms we have seen uh, what, what works, what doesn't work as a communication vehicle. So to, to do advertising on. And also we work very closely with, uh, with uh, a lot of kind of uh, fast moving consumer good companies to improve their packaging in an in-store, but also online setting as well. So that's why you, they come up with different designs and we basically test these designs look at how you know do they get attention on the shelf do people respond to them properly when they see them is the product easy to find 
uh, to what extent, uh, you know, for, for, for Tesco, for example, the retail company, we've been working on uh, the shelf edge label. So basically, how do you design the price tag even? So, and, and what is the difference between a paper-based version of the price tag and an electric uh, price tag? How do people respond to that? And to what extent does that inform their choices as well? So these are, you know, just an example of some of those choices uh, or projects. And then also all over to, you know, innovation projects. So we have, you know, uh, for IKEA, for example, they wanted to provide a, uh, a new type of service. They wanted to provide renewable energy to their markets. And what we did was to test how people in a relatively mature market uh, for renewable energy responded. I think it was uh, Holland or UK. And at that time, a relatively uh, less matured uh, market for renewable energy, I think that was Poland, how people responded to the offerings that they had. And we did an eye tracking EEG study to basically test how people responded to that. And that's that's actually something we published in in Harvard Business, Business Review here a few years ago, uh, four, four, five years ago. You mentioned TikTok. What are the methods of communication, do's and don'ts on TikTok? Oh yeah. Um, so I have to, we have done several studies for them, and uh, I think let me think back to that. Um, some of the main findings we've done for TikTok is that due to the at least one of the findings is that due to the massive engagement, especially at the time we tested, you know, TikTok was on a massive you know increase in interest, and I think that what we see these days is that people have they have now kind of pretty kind of mixed feelings about TikTok, right? Um, even the younger generation seems to be, you know, holding a little back, especially for different parts of the world that seem to be holding a little back in terms of TikTok. Um, there's a lot of criticism. So this was before all that happened. So what we saw in the data was that there was an immense kind of engagement factor. We saw that advertising on average was, uh, was easier to get eyeballs. So it was easier to be seen and when you advertise on TikTok and it was easier to get engagement and people to watch for a longer time compared to other platforms. So they kind of blew up the benchmark from the rest of the social media industry, if you like. So I think that was the, the first thing. What we also discovered was that the you know you had to design your ads in a different way than on typical all other types of social media. And as you mentioned before, you know, you know there are certain types of ads that should be more, be more kind of uh, organic content like. Those ads tended to be kind of viewed more, so to speak. And I think that when people don't differentiate too much between the organic content and the ads, then the ads tend to get more um, more views and more engagement. But, you know, I've heard, like I've seen and I've heard like a lot of stories about actually TikTok having very high reach and engagement levels, but very low conversions. And especially yeah. with, like a lot of influencers who were like into millions of followers on TikTok. And then they like went to the conventions and they had nobody show up to their booth. Like, so. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's, that's one of the, as I mentioned before, it's like there's a distinction between how the ad works and how the brand, you know, the benefit for the brand. And I think that uh, ad creatives are not kind of to, to throw stones at ad creators, but they are very focused on creating a, a compelling narrative and engaging narrative that, you know, captures people's attention and their interest and engages with them to the extent that it can sometimes be at the cost of the brand communication or the call to action. So I think that and th there's tons of different examples from from the literature on this that people people pay a lot of attention and they remember a lot from the actual ad but it doesn't translate and doesn't convert people to either click a button or to remember anything from the brand afterwards so one of the solutions you can do with that is that is that you can embed the brand or a, a, a branded product as a natural part of the narrative and this is something that is easier for for, for for the the creatives to work with is to say that yes it's almost like product placement in your own ad to be honest right so you see product placement if you look at uh you know some of these transformer movies for example you will see like uh you will see uh you will see uh, beat by dre you will see uh apple yeah, or whatever computers all over the place right yeah. uh victoria's secret uh, i think it was a bus almost exploding as well so it's like tons of brands are in even the trailer itself right so I think one way to think about this is like maybe you should consider doing um, you should doing a a a, um, 
a kind of brand placement in your own ad. It should be a natural part of, of the ad itself. So if a person drinks from a bottle, for example, it should be your brand of product. If they wear some shoes, it should be your shoes. So re repetition on that. And I think that as you write as well, using influencers is always a risky business for two reasons mainly. One, influencers can go rogue. <laughs> they can they can uh, they can misbehave and they can you know, fall out of uh, popularity in, in 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 overnight, right? That's one thing. The other thing is also a highly if there's too much of a disconnect in the influencer and the brand, if a if an influencer is not kind of a, a truthful and believable representative of your brand, then people don't, they won't kind of match it up, so to speak. And we've seen this in, you know, for example, there was an ad by Michael Phelps um, making an ad for Intel, for example. Uh, there was no natural connection between Michael Phelps, the swimmer, and uh, Intel. So that meant that people saw the ad, remember that it was for, for you know, they could see that it was uh, Michael Phelps, but basically nobody remembered that it was for Intel. So that means that it was not kind of embedded as a natural part of the ad. And uh, it, and then connection between the influencer or the famous person and and the brand was not existent. You know, I, I've been, uh, as you were saying, like embed the product and the brand, I was thinking more about uh, like the Coca-Cola commercials, especially the Christmas ones. And the ones where, you, yeah. where they pass on the bottle, like from one to one, or like they drive the truck. Is that something you're talking about? Like having the actual product be the main kind of purpose of the narrative which is being told yes yes and i think that what we shouldn't forget and this is what one of the things that we see in in narratives as well is that uh, you know creators want to create this narrative arc that there's a there's a problem there's some kind of conflict and there's a resolution and that's where the uh, the, the brand or the product comes in right and i think that we need to think of that people don't really usually think in that terms and we want to we really want to kind of embed the brand as part of the the narrative all the way through not just kind of plastering it on you know the, the commercial itself but you know embedding it as a natural part of, of the story that's like a creative challenge in itself but i think that uh creatives are more than happy to take it on you know <clears throat> i'm a big uh I don't know, I guess, anarchist in the marketing community because I disagree in the existence of Gen Z as the target audience mm. uh, for various reasons. For one, I'm not sure how you can group billions of people, I think, by now into a singular target audience. Like, for example, I, by some definitions, am a Gen Z, but then, like, from my background, from where I get, uh, where I was born, how I was raised, I don't really fall into the same category. So, like, I'm not sure how Gen Z works, which is weird because, like, I'm trying to get some Gen Z marketers to debate with me on the podcast and nobody comes <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> but what I want to ask you is, like, have you seen any difference in the way uh, people react to advertisements, whether they be older people, millennials or older? or being younger people like Gen Z's or Alphas, do they have different responses to the messages, to the hooks, to the calls to actions? Uh, yes, I would say that there are generational differences. Some of them are biological, some of them are more cultural, I would say, right? So so there are certain types of biological changes. As we get older, for example, I'm, I'm 50 now, right? so, so that means that as we get older, there are certain types of cognitive responses that are not as fast as before. We're actually responding to pretty less emotional. I, you know, when I did my PhD, I studied how cognitive and emotional responses change as we get older, from you know 18 to 86 years old. So I changed, you know, look at how the brain uh, changes and how cognitive and emotional changes over over with aging, right? And what we've seen is that people with older age tend to have a, a a lower emotional response in general they don't get as excited or as 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 they as kind of as uh, fearful as uh, younger people and we also see that uh cognitive load kind of the, the ability to hold information and contain complex information also gets down with age um so that means that when you communicate to different age groups you should bear in mind that emotions maybe you should boost the emotions a little bit and you should reduce the amount of information because the, all the complexity of, of the information. 
Um, that's that's kind of a few things. I would say that I can understand where you come from when it comes to kind of generations, because I, of of course, you know, putting a label on you know hundreds of millions of people. I uh, I think that the only way to think about that is that you might think of maybe there's like within each culture. So uh, in, in in Scandinavia, for example, or in 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 Northern Europe, for example, there's kind maybe there's a Gen Z component. You know, I'm a Gen X myself. And I have so many times had this kind of eerie talk with, you know, I have a, one of my colleagues here is uh, from South Africa, for example, and he grew up, he's like two years my senior or something. We grew up doing exactly the same thing. We made the mixtapes. We were exposed to the same ads. We were exposed to, you know, the yo-yo, you know, the, the, the frenzies and all these things. So we kind of grew up very much feeling that when we talk about things, we're kind of exposed to the same kind of cultural, kind of Western cultural things at the time. So I think that that might be like the common denominator is what you have been exposed to as a as a generational thing, because you've kind of lived through the same period, so to speak. So on average, you have maybe been exposed to certain things. Now, there is a big variance in, you know, individual differences, gender effects and things like that. But I think that maybe that's how we should think about generations. It's not so much that this generation is almost like hard coded to respond in a way. It's more that they have been culturally being exposed to certain things over a period of time. Well, that's I think you're talking more about like some sort of uh, meme or like memes in sort of like a scientific sense or like ideas which yeah. people refer to. Like the big thing about Simpsons was at the time is that everybody in America watched it. Like I'm not sure how about it was for Europe, but everybody in America watched it, and it was like the same kind of cultural jokes going on, right? But right. again, when I try to have those discussions with like Gen Z marketers, or again as I like research their content, uh, their interviews, their stuff, they default to things such as young people don't trust the government. Young people want to have money to be in their own. Young people are rebels, like more rebellious, more freedom loving. And I just kind of think about it and I'm like, okay, that is all true, but like, it's not Gen Z specific. This is no. young people specific. Most young you could just go, are... Yeah, you could just go back to, I think it's some, some of the early uh, writings of, uh, or references to Socrates, for example, and I think Plato and Socrates kind of have a, they have a kind of a that's part of a passage that says like, oh, these young people, they're always kind of making a fuss and they're not really up to doing any good. Or it's like basically you can just take that text and you can put it into an equal age person like me saying something about young people today. Right. So it would be exactly the same. So you're absolutely right about that. So that's why I, I see more the kind of the generational thing more as a as a kind of what you have been exposed to, so to speak. So, you know, one thing that, and especially kind of the big trends, I would say. So as a Gen X, for example, you would be growing up under the Cold War, for example, and that has definitely kind of provided a type of sentiment or a type of thinking. And, you know, also the the, the, the Rocky movies and all the kind of the war movies, the Vietnam movies and all that, so that, that had definitely kind of a an impact on how you would approach things uh, the way I see it. And there's, but, but you know, is Gen Z in, China and Japan the same as a Gen Z in Denmark and the US? No, I don't think so. But it's but it's maybe it's kind of generational thing. That's maybe we should we should just stick a label and say that's the solution. Yeah, well, no, definitely like because like again, Western culture, like Western broadly speaking, is kind of unified in the sense, and then the Asian culture is more unified. But then again, like it's more like Chinese is probably its own uh, set of ideas which they share between themselves, and yep. uh, Japan is. Japan is like a completely different world. <laughs> like, I, I don't get what they have going there. Uh, but I'm just thinking like for me, uh, so I was born in the 90s and I probably relate more to the Gen X uh, of the Western world because that's when the uh, Soviet Union fell apart and we started getting, sure. uh, we started getting Rocky movies and Star Wars yeah. movies and Terminator movies. So. A lot of my like yeah like I was I watched this movies like way before I should have probably, but that is because they became available, and yeah. uh, I'm not sure I'm like as exposed to being like what is commonly known as Gen Z right now, but right. in regarding uh, the communication and as you said like obviously your cognitive uh, abilities change throughout your life, 
yes, there is a different way you approach young people, but there is a different way you approach young people in general, not that mm. Gen Z. Like you, you're going to be approaching Gen Alpha probably the same. Well, with the exception, you're going to use different, uh, I guess, like forms. You're going to use different uh, cultural heroes or like other social events which happen. Yeah. That's uh, like my feeling. But like, again, nobody in Gen Z wants to talk with me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can uh, make something happen you know maybe reach out to uh, i don't know there could be some people that would be interested uh listening to this podcast <laughs> sure that would be great um which actually brings me so you already spoke about like what neurons is doing kind of bringing it all together uh could you maybe reiterate some of the things which you're focusing right now again from your product uh, side uh, some of your plugins said one of the things which I'm definitely getting and I want to arm my designers with is the one which is for the Figma plugin because I think it's really useful. I just launched my website right after I found out about you. <laughs> so okay. I could have done it in a different way. <laughs> Should have waited a bit, but we we're going to see yeah. and make improve upon it. And uh, yeah, the, good thing, yeah, the good thing is that websites are not static, right? So there will always yeah. be time to, to rehack. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And yeah, tell people maybe how they can in get involved with uh, neurons, uh, maybe where they can find you and uh, what sort of like uh, things which you, how can neurons basically change their businesses once they sign sure, up? Absolutely. So the way to think about this is that you in, in general, when you're working in marketing or anything you do commercially, you want to, in a sense, be able to predict how people will respond. If you can just, uh, you know, uh brush up a uh, crystal ball and say you know uh, what will happen on you know how many people will go to this website or how will this ad work in, on social media which media social media should i use it for and so forth um until now that's basically been impossible but what we have found ways to do is that to create an online platform where you can sign up you have an account you upload your assets and if it's an image it just takes you like 10 seconds or something like that and you get a result. And that result is basically one, it's a heat map that shows you where people are going to pay attention. You can draw areas of interest to see, you know, where the brand is, the person, the text, or things like that. And you'll be able to see how much attention does it get. You can also compare that to a benchmark to say, if this is a social media ad, for example, you can now say, is that, um, is that a, uh, you know, how does that perform to, to industry benchmarks, for example? So so this is like a platform that you can go, for example, to the website, neuronsync.com. You sign up uh, through that platform or contact. You can be contacted by part of some of our experts that will help you basically set the uh, the account up and you'll be ready to go with your um, with your with your, uh, your employers, uh, your employees, for example. So in your sense, that could be your designers. You could be your brand manager. It could be also working for as a as a uh, as a company for other clients, for example. So you could also work use this as a tool to kind of pre-vet your assets. So when a company comes to you, and if you're an agency and you want to create ads for them, you can say we already pre-tested this using the, the neurons platform to see we actually get attention. We know that it's engaging. It's it's going to be memorized and it's going to provide this type of brand memory, for example. So that's that's what you can use it for. Or as a company yourself, you can do this for multiple steps in the consumer journey. So you can do it for advertising on different platforms. You can do it for a website. You can also do it for packaging, for example, as well. So this means that it becomes a tool, uh, almost like a language you can use throughout the consumer journey uh, for your campaign. Can I ask you one more question, which I forgot to ask earlier? Do, sure. color, do colors matter? Is there such thing as like color psychology? Obviously certain colors e evoke certain emotions, but how much is it like of a big uh, deciding factor? Now it's a, it's a great question. I think uh, the, the answer unfortunately is yes and no. <laughs> so yes, colors matter, but the way that they matter, it depends on the culture you grew up in. So, you know, most cultures we are exposed to red being a certain, uh, you know, uh, as a biological. Yeah, so it's like a warning color. It's it has kind of an, an attention color, for example, but it also has certain kind of potential negative connotations for people. 
in certain types of, uh, you know, blue tends to have and green tends to have certain types of values, but those are learned and acquired values, right? So I think that what you need to pay attention is to is more the cultural component of color psychology. Biologically, there's a lot of speculation if red is more like, uh, you know, re related to certain biological mechanisms. I would say that's mostly speculative, to be honest. Uh, I think that for advertising and commercial purposes, color psychology should be more driven by you know how the culture perceives it and I, it, everything is testable right so you if you're interested try, test the blue versus green or blue uh, or, or red for example see how do people you know do people actually respond differently to it and, and this is something that we do for example as well we have asked for example do people pay attention differently to ads if they come from different cultures that read from right to left or left to right and we've shown that it actually doesn't matter too much. It shows that people in Iran, for example, who read from right to left, they actually process ads in very much the same way as we do uh, in cultures that read from left to right. So this means that there's this kind of cultural component because I think that the world is becoming more and more homogenous in terms of you know commercial uh, look and feel, that people now process ads in very much the same way. 20 years ago, it might have been different, but now it seems to be very much the same. And the same thing we would also do for you know gender differences, for example. There's a lot of speculation if gen genders are responding very differently to ads in general. They don't. So they actually pay attention to the same ads very much in the same way. Uh, there might be specific you know types of responses, but overall the picture is that there's not too much kind of gender effect. So that's like uh, you know it's always possible to ask questions and then run a study to to test it out. But is it not all like? you say like cultural differences like read left to right or like male or female but is it not a lot like uh hardwired in our brains sort of well we're, we're all humans we have the same like behavioral like and evolutionary psychology affecting us so sure, there's certain types of behaviors that are hardwired so being scared for example if there's an explosion outside now then you know both you and i will jump in our seat and that we will have very strong emotional responses and that's like a survival mechanism so these are very kind of robust responses and so we tend to have that we also tend to have a preference for symmetry in faces and certain types of you know we have a much stronger more positive response to you know uh, smiles and things that we pay more attention to that and this comes more or less you know born we see that babies who are more or less inboard, they tend to prefer looking at symmetric faces versus non-symmetric faces or less symmetric faces. So there are certain things that we can still use as a kind of biological things. But as I mentioned, for color psychology, there might be things that we are, you know, we typically kind of more culturally trained to respond in a particular way. Hmm. Okay. And it's okay. all very mixed up. So I think that's part of the problem, right? It's, it's actually very complex. And the best way to approach it is to test it. That's what makes it interesting. Yeah, yes. like, and that's what makes it creative and that's where neurons can help many people right now absolutely, absolutely. oh it's uh it's fascinating discussions uh to have with you uh again thank you very much for coming again uh where can people find you and get in touch with you if they want to if you're open for it sure uh they can either go to neuronsinc.com the website they can also follow me on linkedin uh, but they can also follow me on my 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 homepage, which is thomasramsoy.com. All right. Well, once again, thank you, Thomas, and uh, thank you, audience. I hope you enjoyed today's fascinating discussion about neuromarketing. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.